afternoon indeed. Welcome to today's webinar from Enterprise IoT Insights. Our topic today is smart manufacturing and the role of IoT in industry. My name is James Blackman. I'm editor of Enterprise IoT Insights. I'll be chairing today's session. I'm joined by a fantastic panel, which will each present on the subject of smart manufacturing before we open up to a Q&A session, which you will uh, be able to get involved in. But first things first, let me introduce our panelists today. Uh, in order of appearance, I would like to welcome Gavin Strack, Executive Director at Convergio, a software company based out of Perth in Australia, and a specialist in the, in the fields of mining, oil and gas, and utilities. Pierce Owen is a leading analyst at ABI Research, looking at the industrial internet and IT OT convergence. We have Greg Kinsey with us, is vice president at Hitachi Vantara, which operates as a kind of uh, digital change agent, offering analytics, industrial uh, expertise and uh, technology solutions. We have, we have Srivats Ramaswamy, who is on the board of the Manufacturing Enterprise Solutions Association, otherwise known as MESA. He's also VP for IT at San Mina, which makes ele electronics and is based in uh, California. Joe Speed goes fifth today. He is a uh, field CTO for technology and solutions at AD Link. AD Link provides edge computing for industrial IoT systems. And finally, I'd also like to introduce Jean Philippe Provencher, or just JP from PTC. He is Vice President for Strategy and Solutions, and uh, PTC is a, a tech vendor and a leader in the field of industrial transformation. Welcome all. Thanks very much for joining us. Just some quick background to start to let you know something of Enterprise IoT Insights. Enterprise IoT Insights is a premier news source for enterprise decision makers, launched by RCR Wireless in 2016. The target audience is ex executives and volume buyers at enterprise class organizations. You can find us online variously, our URL and Twitter handle is on your screen now. There, mine is two. Um, as is my email, should you wish to follow up. Uh, just to flag that today's webinar is attached to, an, uh, to a long editorial report, 36 pages in high resolution on the same theme, approaches and use cases for smart manufacturing. It is in depth, full of opin opinion, and uh, we urge you to check it out. The, uh, the report will be available to download after this session. Just add forward slash channels, forward slash reports to the homepage URL, as you see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, just as a quick overview uh, of the report, just to whet your app appetite briefly, uh, the report provides a narrative about the state of the market, but also seeks to, to boil down and distill ways to approach this market for those enterprises just starting out. It takes the best information av available from the vendors out there to give you a sense of what you're getting into. This graphic here, appropriated from PTC, which is talking later, is the, is the nearest summary I've found of, of what to look for, depending on your sector and your speciality. It tells you what you need in terms of technology to drive uh, transformation. And just very quickly, the report also brings you a ton of use cases, which are, which are you know, generally hard to find. No one really wants to talk about their competitive edge. But uh, Enterprise IT Insights has included these uh, stories from across the manufacturing sector, whether you're making cars or air conditioning units or beer or sausages or indeed gold, as we will hear momentarily. Anyway, I like, like I said, the report's online. I urge you to take a look. Uh, the agenda today, um, all of our panelists will present for about five minutes each, and then we turn over to questions and to you. Uh, there is a dialog box on your screen, so if you have questions as we go, uh, use it and, uh, you know, please fire away. Um, 
And a last piece of housekeeping, this session is being recorded and will be made available along with the slides at the end. Okay, so that's it from me. Uh, for now, I would like to hand over uh, to Gavin Strack from Convergio in Australia, where it is late, approaching midnight. Uh, by way of introduction to this whole piece, Gavin is going to talk about how data and just data on its own really managed well is golden. Gavin, good day or good evening. Thanks for joining us. Good day. Thanks for the opportunity. I hope everyone is as well. Uh, yeah, we called our uh, presentation uh, Pi Alchemy and uh, recognition of using, turning data into gold. Um, so uh, I want to talk quickly about that. I realise we've got five minutes, so we'll try and be quick. Um, the example that we had is uh, for a company called Aurelia Metals and their Hero Processing Plant. Uh, that's a, a glamour shot of the plant. It normally doesn't look that good, I promise. Um, but uh, that's where all the action um, happened. Um, and if you flip to the next slide, you'll probably see um, a bit of a situation of where they were. So back in December 2015, um, there was a relatively new plant. They were about 18 months, two years old. Uh, had lots of problems, um, both with the equipment, uh, the bottle making, performance of the assets. Uh, it wasn't fantastic. Um, and it wasn't, a, um, I guess, a pleasant place to be. That uh, The organisation had just managed to recapitalise and refinance, um, but they were basically told we've got to turn the program around um, or we're going to be in trouble. So in terms of performance metrics, uh, the plant recovery was pretty low, 74-ish percent, and for an average gold plant, that's very bad. Uh, we'd like to see that up in the 90s. Um, profit was pretty low. They didn't have much in the way of cash. Uh, they've extended all of their lines of credit. Um, and their actual operational performance um, in terms of unit cost was, uh, was pretty bad as well. They're very low margins. And considering the gold price, um, it was all up from here. Um, so there was limited in terms of capital as well. So it was all very much of trying to make do with what we've got. We flick over to the next slide. Um, this is a 3D model of the plant. And when we were called in, um, we basically wanted to find out where the main pain points were and try and have a data-driven improvement campaign to try and give us our maximum bang for buck. Um, in as, as timely manner as possible because they just had to. Um, and in most mining mineral processing plants, um, it's typically at the front end, the grinding and crushing and leaching areas are where most of the opportunities lie. Um, so we applied several um, uh, techniques in through there, uh, or for actually before we had did that, we actually had to try and get the data. So we put in some infrastructure, some process historians, and started to um, have some data to play with. And we started building models and various analytics functions uh, and quantified the areas of improvement. And we just started queuing up campaigns. Um, so over the, the next slide, um, we've got some results in terms of before and after. Um, we started at the front end um, with the mill. Um, the classification and grinding is, is typically a, a really good place to start. Um, and the trends along the top there is how the plant was operating. Um, this is a highly automated plant. It's the automation wasn't configured that well. So um, in terms of metrics, you can see the change in, in process um, excursions and deviations in terms of levels and flows. Um, and that's a, a direct impact on efficiency. Um, and that was primarily um, uh, around the, the actual control schemes that we used and how the plants were configured. Um, on the next slide, uh, once we got grinding and classification, we went into flotation. Um, 
for those who aren't familiar with flotation, um, they're like big bubble baths, um, and they're very, very sensitive, um, quite complex animals to operate and to get working correctly. Um, but the critical thing for the flotation cells is to get the level control right. Um, and they weren't, they were bouncing around all over the place, so we made them stable, um, and that directly improved the uh, performance of that circuit. Once they were right, we went further down the line, and on the next slide, you'll be able to see um, further down, we had um, concentration uh, flotation circuits. Uh, the pre previous slide was the roughers. Um, and we made a significant improvement there. The concentration is where uh, your concentrate, that's where your gold is. So we want to make sure that that's being very well controlled and we're recovering as much gold as we can out of that. Uh, after flotation, uh, we went to, if you flip to the next slide, into leaching. Um, and here we had um, the statistical quality um, models. Um, the problem that we have um, with reagent control here is we're trying to control um, parts per million concentration in very large tanks that take several hours for the material to go through. So it's incredibly challenging uh, from a control perspective. Um, it's imagine driving down the highway at you know, 100 miles an hour and uh, you, you turn the steering wheel and several hours later the car starts to change direction. Um, <laughs> that's that's the, uh, the analogy I like to use there. Um, and it's, uh, in this case, the reagent is cyanide. So it's uh, something that we want to be make sure, yeah, very mindful of. We don't want um, to use too much of it and, uh, and create a environmental issues that we need to deal with. Um, and also, if we don't want to not use enough of it and then find that the, the gold is coming out to the tailing stand. Um, so we... Um, we're able to get some significant improvements there. Um, and then towards the back end, it was the filtration circuit. Um, these were, um, yeah, uh, so no more. Um, the, the trends along the top give an indication of how erratic they were. These are very high, like a great big accordion, very high pressure plates being squashed together. And um, we built some models around uh, a proper operating envelope. Um, and that, that was then able to um, drive our optimization and improvement. Um, so big changes in spikes in the pressure, and that also addressed equipment fatigue and uh, maintenance issues. Um, the next slide had a similar result um, on the pre-ship filter, which was probably one of the worst I've seen. Um, and it also it provided a new visualisation for the operators. Instead of looking at a number on a screen, um, if you can see on the bottom left of those graphs, uh, we've got a, a blue curve uh, with an operating envelope and the instructions to the operator was uh, just keep the dot in the blue band. If um, as the real-time process is updated, that dot moves around. As long as it's in the blue, you're all good. Um, and that was a lot easier for the operators to use and operate. Um, the accumulation of all of those uh, optimization and, um, uh, and improvement campaigns over the period of about nine months was a significant improvement in plant performance um, and 1% improvement uh, when we looked at the economic model was about 750000 US per annum in profit, not revenue, profit. Um, and then on the next slide, you'll see, um, in addition to profitability and improvement in, in unit costs, we, um, we actually got the plant up to exceed its nameplate capacity. So we debottlenecked it and got it performing more than what it was designed for at the same time as making it cheaper and making more money. Um, so yeah, that was the, the net result of all of that and that was basically all um, driven by data, driven by models, driven by analytics and um, have using that as a, a target improvement campaign. So, thank you.
Thank you, Gavin. That was great. Um, moving, moving on, just in the interest of time, I'd like to introduce Pierce Owen from ABI Research, who is going to talk about uh, smart manufacturing platforms and how to choose them. Pierce, great to have you with us. Over to you. Great. Hey, James, can you, can you hear me okay? We can, yes. All right, excellent. I apologize if my voice fades out. I got married this past weekend, and I'm working remotely today. Uh, so uh, my name is Pierce Stowe, and I'm Principal Analyst of uh, Smart Manufacturing at ABI Research. We're a market insights firm, provides strategic guidance around transformative technologies, and, and I focus on smart manufacturing in particular. Uh, James asked me to join today to present some of my research where I ranked the smart manufacturing platform. So if we uh, move on to the next slide, I'll dive right into how we define that. So um, we define smart manufacturing platforms as the software that collects data from assets on the factory floor. Uh, when we're talking about the factory floor, that obviously involves a lot of protocol translation and adaptation. So, so that's one piece we looked at. Uh, in these in these platforms and they, they deliver that data to applications at the edge or in the cloud or at any layer of the ITOT stack from the control systems to the enterprise software or the, or the cloud like I said uh, we only included those platforms with external customers so uh, some some promising software like you might see at Honeywell is not being uh, offered uh, publicly it, as, as an external uh, to, to external customers. So we wouldn't have included them, but uh, only those who, who are selling uh, or, or offering their, their software externally. Uh, and, and we also, um, a big focus on, of this was, was platforms that supported other transformative technologies. So if we go to the next slide, uh, you can see our methodology here. Uh, so we used the root mean square method to score and rank the, the platforms. Um, and uh, you, you can see uh, our, our two main criteria were innovation and implementation. Um, and uh, it, under, under those, you can see the technologies we looked at and, and the criteria uh, that, that we ranked, and I wish I had time to dive more into the methodology. I uh, might be able to take some questions about that later, um, but uh, it's uh, because of the time, I want to go ahead and talk about our results. So if we go to the next slide, here uh, you can see our vendor matrix. So, so we had 11 platforms that we ranked, and we divided them um, into leaders, followers, and, and one laggard uh, ba based on those criteria in the previous slide. So we, we named PTC our overall leader. Um, th this is due to outstanding scores in um, uh, augmented reality, mixed reality with Euphoria, uh, protocol adaptability, ad adaptability and connectivity with uh, Kepware um, and, and the other platforms, and, and digital twins with their combination of technologies on ThingWorks. So, so they were the overall leader in innovation and, and, um, and in that root uh, mean square method for overall. Now, one thing um, that might raise some eyebrows is, is the placement of GE on here, considering there being uh, GE Digital is being sold for parts, and that's been a long time coming. Uh, it's, it's our view that this is bad for the smart manufacturing movement. Uh, they, uh, they were very slow to roll out their offerings. Uh, they did not fulfill their promises initially, but they served as a catalyst and a wake-up call for, for a lot of the technologies we're talking about today uh, within the uh, manufacturing and industrial industries. And they really spurred companies like ABB and Siemens to, to launch their own initiatives and kick the industry into gear. Now, um, the GE disappearing won't affect adoption very much right now, but it, it could slow future innovation because like I said, they were a catalyst and um, I think it's particularly sad because they'd finally just started to get their act together. Um, and they, they'd partnered with uh, PTC's Kepware for protocol adaptability, ad adaptability and connectivity. They'd invested in other transformative technologies such as artificial intelligence and blockchain. They'd uh, customized Foghorn's uh, complex event processing engine for edge intelligence. So, so they, they really put together a few good um, technologies and partnerships um, with a high level of security that, that um, they, they, yeah, they, they had finally just started to put out 
a quality product when um, these announcements came out that they were um, selling selling them off uh, for for bigger reasons within the uh, overall GE organization. Uh, one more uh, company I'd like to highlight before I run out of time is Hitachi, which you can see is right there on the edge of followers and leaders. Um, they, they scored relatively low in protocol adaptability um, due to a lack of flexibility with, with other manufacturers' uh, products. That they, they don't have that flexibility that you see with, with Kepware, uh, um, but they scored highest in enterprise and cloud integration, and, and there's some, some really good technology there, and that's why they're right on the edge and could easily move into the leader circle uh, when, when we look at this again next year. Um, and then I'll wrap up if we go to the next slide. Um, if, if you're interested, we, we do have a ton more research around these topics with Transformative Horizon showing how we uh, think uh, technologies are going to evolve in smart manufacturing in the next several years. Uh, report on sensor-based applications, uh, the industrial cloud, ITOT integration, uh, and a huge market data set, set on the digital factory market uh, that, that we just released uh, last week or the week before. Um, so th that's all I've got, and I think I've used up my five minutes. So thank you, James. Thank you, Pierce. Uh, that was that was fantastic. Just a note on platforms is, uh, you know, it's it's it might be just it's not an easy Coke Pepsi comparison. I don't know, but uh, our next speaker was also ranked uh, ranked highly in a in a Gartner uh, study uh, as visionary visionary for its Lumada platform, but. Uh, uh, which I really guess, I guess, um, as much as anything, speaks to the strength of the panel today. But uh, less of that, uh, I'd like to introduce Greg Kinsey from Hitachi Vantara, who will talk about use cases and approaches in this market. Greg, thanks for being here. You're on. Thanks, James. So, yeah, just a brief introduction. I'm, uh, I'm leading the smart manufacturing activities of Hitachi Vantara. Hitachi Vantara is a newly formed division of Hitachi, which is focused on digital transformation services and technologies. Uh, we are part of a, the larger Hitachi, which is a $90 billion company with roughly 300,000 people around the world, making all sorts of technologies and industrial equipment. And what I'm going to talk about today is the approach that we take for smart manufacturing. I'm going to drill down on, on the three most common use cases. And uh, this is actually a combination of the work we're doing in Hitachi's own factories, as well as work that we're doing with our clients globally. So the first point is that we believe smart manufacturing is a journey, not a solution. So there is no out of the box solution to, to make your factory smart. Uh, we engage with our clients on a journey, and you start at your current level, at whatever level you might be with your factory, and we've developed a maturity model, a six-phase maturity model for smart manufacturing. So behind the maturity model, um, we've developed certain capabilities and criteria, and we've also developed certain technologies that allow you to advance on the maturity model. The important thing is that you can unlock value at each stage uh, of your journey. Um, and it's much more than just technology. Uh, it includes the, the people and organization side of manufacturing. It covers your processes, your operating model, um, and specifically how you aggregate and use what we call 4M data. So 4M is, is inspired by the Ishikawa methodology, if you're familiar with that, where we collect data from man-machine materials and methods across the factory. And that's where IoT comes in. I mean, IoT is about connecting to devices or, or connecting to, to machines. But most of the projects we work on, it, it's really about the manufacturing capabilities that we can unlock. Early on, you get some gains by being able to visualize your factory, being able to integrate your processes, break down some of those silos. Uh, you get to level three, you start to be able to do some basic analysis. And then level four is where it gets interesting. There you get more predictive you start to be able to predict uh, problems before they occur. Uh, level five then, you get more prescriptive, so not only can you predict the problems, but you can prevent them. And level six is a concept that we're developing in Hitachi Labs, and that's what we call symbiotic manufacturing, and that's about the, the, the intelligent factory that's uh, self-optimizing and, and self-healing. So that's kind of an overview, and, and, and really what we do is we accompany uh, our clients on this journey we are technology agnostic, 
So while we have uh, a, a blueprint or framework, which we call Lumata, uh, we have a number of tools and technologies in the Hitachi shop. We also work with many partners, um, and we've, we've done projects uh, using, you know, for example, Microsoft tools or PTC tools or, or, or whatever. Um, really, the focus is whatever makes sense for our clients, uh, we'll work with them to accompany them on, on this journey. I think the AI part is very important. Machine learning comes into play towards some of these uh, higher level functionalities. And what we typically do is we start with unsupervised learning. We move on to supervised learning where we uh, build upon usually the Six Sigma um, methodology that's in play in, in most factories. And then eventually we work towards reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is key because it allows you to focus on maximizing an outcome, whether that's quality or capacity or, or, or speed or what have you. And so uh, in many of the cases, over the, the period of a project, we'll move from supervised learning to, to actually start to build reinforcement learning as the system gets smarter and smarter. So next slide, James. So the top three use cases um, that we've done, and these are based on the project experience of the last, I would say, two to three years globally. Um, the first one we started around was to be able to predict and prevent quality problems. And there we've got a number of different environments that we've done projects in. Uh, one of the first ones was a pharmaceutical manufacturer. And one of the keys to that, um, that project was that we were able to plug in the weather forecast into the algorithm because the production was very sensitive to changes in temperature and humidity. Um, the mixing of polymers was another one we did in the tire industry. Uh, we've actually done two projects where we were able to increase the yield of the, of the mixing process in order to make it more resilient to changes in product recipe and changes in product design. Um, automotive components, we've done uh, several projects in that, uh, specifically a case study with the company Daiso. Uh, you can find some information on that online about the, the, the project that we did. It was quite a, a sophisticated end-to-end -end quality analytics system. Uh, we did work with an air conditioning uh, manufacturer, and last but not least, we've done product projects in injection molding, which is quite a common area. So in general, the ROI on these projects is about three to one. Um, if you can go back, James, uh, about three to one ROI on the quality. That means, in general, rule of thumb, invest around a million dollars, and you get three million back in, in operating costs. Similarly, in the second area, we've done a number of projects around predicting and preventing bottlenecks. And then the third one, the third use case, is around predicting and preventing unplanned downtime in a factory. And there we're working with a European automaker um, to allow them to improve their uh, uptime and reduce their costs. So the most important thing is to understand the problem you're trying to solve understand the process, and understand the data and what the data can do for it. So we don't really start with a solution, but we really start with a problem. Now if we go to the next slide, James. And the key to how we do this is uh, through what we call co-creation. We work through a number of, of, of steps in an innovation process with our clients. We tend to form teams uh, with the, the client and with the Hitachi people. We work on the factory floor five days a week. Uh, we'll usually set up a project room for the duration of the project. And we'll really work through uh, this whole innovation process together with our clients. And I think one of the biggest lessons learned is you need to focus very deeply on the, the problem and the job to be done before jumping to solutions. And most of the projects we've seen that have failed in the past, the reason they failed is because they jumped to a solution too quickly and they fell in love with a specific solution or a technology concept. So with that, uh, next slide, James. Thanks for your time and uh, please, if you're interested in more information about what we're doing, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you. Thanks, Greg, that's fantastic. Uh, we're just, we're running a little over, so I'm, I'll uh, urge the panelists just to try and keep if we can to the five minute slots. Uh, I'd like to introduce now Shrivats Ramaswamy from Mesa, which uh, represents the intersection of manufacturing and technology. Uh, Shrivats, over to you. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. Um, so I'm going to uh, sp I'm speaking on behalf of Mesa International. 
So for folks who don't know about Mesa, we were, uh, we're basically, as James mentioned earlier, we are called a Manufacturing Enterprise Solutions Association. We're actually a nonprofit uh, uh, association and we were founded in 1992. Uh, we have members in over 40 countries, thousands of members. And personally, uh, I'm a member of the Mesa board. I'm also the vice president of IT at uh, Senmina Corporation. Senmina is a six and a half billion manufacturer located in over 25 countries. I also am the CTO for 42Q, a business unit of Senmina. Can you go next slide, please? Yeah, so what uh, Mesa is about, for folks who are not very familiar with Mesa, we focus on where manufacturing meets IT. I'm sure every one of you here is familiar with the IT and the OT convergence and what's happening in that space. Mesa's goal is really to build bridges of understanding from the plant to the enterprise. And what that means is basically we work with, uh, we, we build a platform or a foundation for employees and manufacturers to get, to get know-hows, knowledge, training, and points of views that they can use, but, and they can get more value out of their uh, enterprise systems by uh, effective leverage and training and knowledge. How do we do this? We do this through three basic mechanisms. Uh, Mesa provides peer-to-peer uh, -peer sessions. We also provide point-of-view sessions, and there's a rich and robust global education program where people can learn about various techniques in manufacturing, foundations of manufacturing, uh, things like uh, how do you get started in uh, smart manufacturing, concepts like that. So that's really what Mesa is providing, and we build all of this by working with the various players in the industry and uh, talking to them, getting the knowledge base, and then creating the education program that our members can leverage. Next slide, please. So I'll talk a little bit about what, and from Mesa point of view, what we are seeing as the current state of manufacturing. And uh, as many of you would recognize, uh, you know, industrial IoT or, uh, you know, uh, the concept around AI, ML vision systems, they're all part of a more, more broader context around what's going on with manufacturers today. Uh, what we are seeing is, um, which I'm sure many of you recognize, is that, you know, ITOT convergence is a hot topic. And it's not where it needs to be, it's emerging. And I'll talk a little bit more about trends that's happening on how it's emerging, what we are seeing there. Um, the second topic is probably very interesting and important to consider. Uh, if you really look at uh, cloud adoption, we, at least from a Mesa point of view, we're seeing that the cloud adoption, the manufacturers lag today. When we say lag, what's, what's really it means? If you look at the industries like CRM or, uh, uh, or the ERP industries, you see that most companies are now talking about coming in the cloud, being in the cloud, and not a consideration for an on-premise solution for a manufacturer doesn't even exist, right? Whereas when it comes to manufacturing, there are still, uh, uh, manufacturers are still lagging in the adoption of cloud. And there, there are some areas where we see that companies have progressed further. Uh, analytics is a good area where uh, most companies, when they think analytics, most of them think about cloud solution, leveraging that. I'll talk a little bit about why cloud makes a lot of sense for that well, in, in the next slide, but until then, I'll cover the rest. Um, there's also the, you know, the trends show that now we are seeing uh, sporadic adoption of manufacturing solutions in the cloud. So what this basically means is that people are starting to move further and further, push the envelope to the traditional OT boundaries within the plant to extending it to connecting up with IT, leveraging uh, no real-time transmit operations, things like that. The second thing that we are seeing also is that, you know, uh, if, you, if you hear about uh, uh, manufacturing execution systems as such, uh, LNS and various other analysts have confirmed this as well, most of 80% of the factories do not have a broad-based MES. And that's pretty interesting because when you think about a factory, factories got assets, people talk about industrial IoT connecting assets, but you also need the process context around it. And that's what manufacturing execution system provides. So we see that as uh, one of the areas that will be a significant change. Uh, lastly, smart manufacturing industry 4.0 is, is driving a lot of cloud adoption. Um, some of the things you're seeing, you know, machine connectivity before was a concern. Uh, now I think proof points are emerging. Security is an interesting one. People talk about security all the time. Uh, before it used to be security is a concern to now, people are saying, okay, how do I manage security? How do I leverage the cloud more often? So we're seeing that trend go. Next slide, please. 
with that, where do we, yeah, next one, James, yeah, thank you. With that, um, the, um, where do we see developments happening pretty significant from a manufacturing and an industrial IoT point of view? Obviously, big data analytics is a big space. That's a little bit what I would consider entering into the more mature area now, where we are seeing purpose-built and platform solutions coming both types. So there are companies that say, if you're specifically trying to solve this problem, here's the answer. You don't need to go figure it out. We give, you, give this to you out of the box. Two, there are areas where you know you have a platform and you can build your own custom solution on it. So we're seeing that range. In terms of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning and AIML is really taken in the vision system. That's the most common. And then the second most common is predictive. Those two, I'm sure every one of you are aware. We're now seeing slowly predictive quality come up to play. And these are leveraging the uh, ML AI models. In the industrial internet of things, I think, uh, you know, the IoT world has taken a, uh, the sensors and all of this taken a big boom. People are uh, jumping in and trying to do things. But what we're also realizing is that the big assets, uh, like the, you know, if you had a, if you're an electronic manufacturer, surface mount, or if anything else, you have a significant large robotics equipment, all those connecting to the cloud are starting to happen as well. So we're seeing some interesting movements there. We are also seeing augmented reality and uh, virtual reality prototypes come up. So uh, when I say prototype, it's because if you think about the uh, bell curve of you know early innovation, early adopter, Main Street. Uh, if you go through that process, you're really somewhere in the early adopter range where people are really using AR, VR prototypes. And lastly, we are seeing some consideration for blockchain happen. Uh, people are now looking into blockchain and how do you take ad advantage of that. Most commonly, blockchain is founded more on the front-end side where you're looking at the after post-manufacturing process, but a manufacturer wants to control distribution and ensure that the product is not uh, you know, counterfeiting, things like that are not being impacting the product quality. So that's kind of what we're seeing as a trend with uh, manufacturers and the industrial energy space. Slide. With that, uh, my contact information, should anybody have questions, feel free to shoot me a note. Thank you, James. Back to you. Srivas, thank you very much. Uh, moving along quickly, up next we have Joe Speed from AD Link, uh, which is making inroads with some of the more advanced technologies out there. Uh, Joe, over to you. Oh, appreciate it. Pleasure to speak with you all today. So, AD Link, you know, we're, we're all about rugged industrial compute. We manufacture, we have uh, factories in Taipei and China. Um, and then we do edge IoT software for our products and for others uh, with labs in UK and other places. So, you know, our bread and butter, typically where you see us is, you know, factory floor and trains, pipelines, mines, wind farms, all these kinds of things. But some of the things that get me most excited is when you take these kinds of technologies and you try to find important issues facing society in terms of tech for good. So things like how do you take public transportation, make it accessible for all? So the contributions, the work we've done with, with IBM, Consumer Technology Association, Local Motors, um, LG, Panasonic, and others around uh, creating crowdsourced open mobility using open source software, open source IoT, uh, autonomous bus for all of us. Uh, some of the work that we do um, following the hurricane down in Puerto Rico. So you have these emergency generators from 25 kilowatt to two megawatt that are not instrumented, not connected, and the only way they have to keep them running and not run out of fuel is to have people in pickup trucks driving all over the island checking the fuel. And so getting those connected, um, getting those monitored instrumented and doing analysis in those. And the things that we do around taking all these technologies, our technologies, partner technologies, open source, and spinning up, quickly spinning up uh, IoT digital experiments. So if somebody has a hypothesis, they have a premise they want to prove, you know, how can they go about exercising that? Next slide. And so in the smart manufacturing, you know, we have a center of gravity around edge IoT. So connecting all the things, local intelligence, local AI, um, machine learning, basically putting this kind of decisioning where the data is generated uh, and being able to connect all the things. So like in a proximal environment, taking all the existing equipment and connecting them together. 
and then being able to bring this to the clouds. Next, next slide. So, you know, various sensors, analytics, different kinds of things that you'd think about, um, even clever things like there's a lot of equipment that is new enough to have a digital display, but old enough that it doesn't have open API, might not be networking like. So being able to do things like in addition to connecting sensors and doing all the mod bus, OPC UA, CAN bus, and these kinds of things, even doing things like connecting uh, DVI or VGA ports and treating whatever information is shown to operators as yet another sensor source and then being able to analyze it locally. Next slide. And so we're doing some interesting things, you know, connecting the unconnected, that really is company's core business, um, working with what you've got, uh, but then bringing this intelligence to the edge. So there's things we're doing, really interesting things with, uh, with NVIDIA and their GPU architecture and tools with Microsoft and their AI at the edge. Uh, Google, uh, so we're a launch partner for the new Google TPU which is a tensor processing unit. So actually, you know, running tensor in silicon, doing things like a tr uh, two trillion operations per second per watt at the edge in a very small form factor. And, uh, and then obviously, you know, things as well, like we do a lot of work with Intel Movidius and, and uh, in addition to creating our own rugged products, we also create rugged compute modules that a lot of the top robot makers and gas turbine makers and others uh, use in their own products. And then connecting that to the cloud. So the things that we do with our friends at PTC, with AWS, with Microsoft, Google, and IBM. Next slide. So in terms of uh, interesting things, um, I've got a lot of interest around computer vision, machine vision, and what this can do. And this is particularly a case where folks like to work with us around edge because with machine vision, you're talking about a high bandwidth sensor, a sensor that is the data from that is not particularly easy to bring to the clouds. And even if you have big enough pipes is rather expensive. Also, you have issues of latency. And this is true for many kinds of these problems is Yes, you could take data to the cloud, study it in the cloud, and bring decisions back, but by the time you do that, the machine might have shredded itself. A worker may have been injured. Uh, you may have missed an opportunity to correct a in-flight weld or other kinds of issues. And so our industrial uh, cameras, for example, we have a partner who takes these, and they've worked with us, and they've come up with the software to be able to install it and train your robot, teach it hand-eye coordination in an hour, uh, working with all the top uh, dozen robot makers. So it's, it's some fun stuff, but then, you know, we take the same technology and we do things like use it in the self-driving bus for the elderly and disabled. So MIT kids develop that the bus can see which seats are empty and then tell a blind rider where they can sit. Uh, our partner Kentrans developed that using our technology, they can understand uh, American Sign Language so that the bus can talk to a, can understand what a deaf rider is saying and then communicate back to them via LG projectors on Asahi glass with a avatar written in Unity game engine rendered on custom NVIDIA cubes that AD Link built for the bus so that you actually see a projection of an avatar doing sign language back to you, whatever IBM Watson is saying to the writer. So really fun stuff and uh, love to work with y'all. Joe, thank you. That's fantastic. Um, uh, finally, I, we move on to the last presentation, which is from JP Provencher from PTC which uh, has already been talked about some and really needs no introduction. Uh, JP, I urge you to keep it, keep it short if you can, but uh, Absolutely. I'm handing over to you. Perfect. You uh, hear me well? Perfectly, yes. So, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be part of this panel here. JP Proventure, Vice President for Manufacturing Solutions and a Strategy at uh, PTC. Uh, let's go to the next slide, James. So, PTC is a billion-dollar enterprise software company. Uh, for the last 30 years, we've been focused on one thing, which is helping global manufacturers transform and digitize the way they design product and the way they run their factories. 
So uh, we come from the world of the digital twin, having a digital representation of your manufacturing operations and your, and your product. And uh, over the last five years, we've been investing heavily in IoT and augmented reality to combine that digital view of your operation with real-time feedback directly from the physical assets that are actually running the process. So really converging the physical world and the digital world and bringing augmented reality and IoT tied back to digital representation of our manufacturing processes and product to a point where uh, we're now recognized as a, uh, a proven and a leading option out there if you want to go after IoT and augmented reality. We have multiple hundreds of factories using ThingWorks today, and a lot of them actually have uh, multiple, multiple expansions where we have customers with 15, 20, 25, 65, 70 factories running uh, ThingWorks and augmented reality. Uh, next slide. Uh, we see a lot of big disruptive technology coming to the factory. There are four that we specifically focus on. If your complexity as a manufacturer resides in the various equipment that you want to connect on your factory and combining all the data silos you have and getting more value from the data you're already inundated with, on your factory, that's where industrial IoT and analytics delivers a lot of value. Helps you to connect to everything, get real-time visibility, and get new insights from the data. If the complexity resides in your labor activities or in the labor operations, in the in if, if the complexity is actually at the labor level, this is why we've invested in augmented reality and uh, good results there where we have thousands of customers using our Vaforia platform to help drive guided work instructions, better changeovers, and helping workers keep up with the increasingly complex manufacturing operations they need to run. And then if complexity resides in your product, then we're also investing in additive manufacturing so you can transform a 15 parts assembly into a single part that you can now produce with the help of additive manufacturing, which fundamentally simplifies also operations and, and supply chain. And then the fourth one, more importantly, what, what Gartner's and other analysts are saying is uh, what you need is actually this technology in a, in a platform so you can apply it more rapidly in your factory. And talking about the platform, next slide. The next question we typically have from our customers is, uh, that looks all good, but where does that fit actually in my uh, current landscape? So uh, anyone running a factory here should recognize the stack on the left. That's the traditional stack of physical sensors, control systems, and MES and corporate systems that we're all trying to connect so we can have top floor to shop floor visibility. And in an IoT world, then there is a sea of new sensor data we need to grab. So uh, two takeaways here in the way we do it with uh, PTC. Next slide. First takeaway is let, let's not try to replace any of those systems. Let's leverage all the investment that we've already done in our factories. Let's keep the assets, the control systems, the MES, the data silos that are already in place. Let's not try to move the data into a data lake, but let's rather connect to the data with an innovation platform, thing worked in this case here, that gives you visibility into machine data, business data, helps you apply analytics to it, and, and make that data meaningful and delivered in a simplified role-based way to people that, by definition, need data from multiple sources, such as plant manager for operational intelligence, maintenance crew to understand the problem, and apply predictive maintenance, quality, and workers. So, so that's really our approach. Let's not start IoT with generating more data. Let's actually start IoT in the factory with leveraging the investment that are already in place and connect rapidly to all these different data silos. A good customer example is a Heritec here. So they were focused on actually flexibility and agility for the shelf floor. So they focused on a six weeks project where remotely they wanted to connect to a fleet of NC machines. Heritec is a multi-billion dollar automotive tier one. They pretty much build all the doors that go on a GM car in North America, but they have factories in uh, North America, in Europe, and in Asia. And they're leveraging IoT to get real-time visibility into their assets. And they are using uh, ThingWorks to bring these new 
use cases very rapidly on a shop floor focused on not a big bang approach, but really agility and flexibility and getting some quick value in a six to eight weeks time frame for every problem that they attack with IoT and augmented reality. So last slide, um, when you start an IoT project, it all comes down to, and someone mentioned it on the, on, on, on the webcast here uh, initially, it all starts with the problem. Uh, these are the set of use cases that we see our customers attacking with IoT and augmented reality. So we, we did some analysis of the thousands of projects that our customers done and looked at the uh, repeatable pattern and typical use cases that they want to deploy with the technology such as ThingWorks and augmented reality. And typically what we see customer doing is target one problem, deploy one use case, get some quick value from it, and then from there go after a couple more use cases in a factory and then deploy to multiple factories. Uh, the top three use case I would say here just for our guidance is operational intelligence. So under operations management, a lot of our customers start with before trying to predict performance, let's actually measure performance. Let's have real-time visibility into how well we're performing. That's operational intelligence. Uh, the second one is predictive maintenance. So we already have a lot of data, and in the factory, we own the data. That's our assets, and we, you can apply IoT, both connectivity and analytics, to gain new insights from the asset data to better run the data, to better run the asset, reduce on time downtime, improve throughput, increase quality. Etc. And then the third big use case we see is at the worker level. Factories are becoming more and more complex, and operators need to keep up. And there we bring two big value elements. One, giving the operator all the data they need from different data sources in one screen, and then ultimately delivering a portion of the data in an augmented reality experience. So they have the best way to actually visualize the data layer directly on top of the physical asset or the physical line they need to, they need to run. I'll stop here, James, uh, fit in within my five minutes and uh, leaving it up to the Q&A. Thank you very much, JP. Uh, so thank you all, that was a fascinating breadth of insight. I, I trust some of your questions have been answered through this process. We are running short, we will run over a little bit just to accommodate any questions you do have, so feel free to get involved. We are now moving in, into the panel session. So, uh, you know, any questions we don't get to, we can come back later. Uh, all the presenters' contact details are available variously in the following slides. Uh, just a reminder, this session is being recorded again. The slides will be available. And if you've signed in already, as you will have, you will get a link to them. Uh, anyway, so moving right along, I think to start with, uh, Greg, I'm interested in the terminology here. Uh, you know, it seems it seems somewhat confusing, and I suspect for enterprises, you know, getting to grips with this, it is. Can you can you talk about IoT or industrial IoT and distinguish it from digital? Say, what is digital? You know, how do sensors on machines fit into the broader digital transformation? Yeah, I, I think, you know, our, our approach at Hitachi is we tend to start with um, the, the view of Industry 4.0, digitization of manufacturing, how digital tools and digital processes can reinvent your end-to-end -end operations. An important part of that is IoT, or connecting things to the Internet, but to, to call the whole thing IoT, we feel is, is, is maybe not the best description. So IoT is a part of it. We don't see IoT as a market. We see it more as an architectural disruption because suddenly you can collect massive amounts of data from machines, devices, sensors, all sorts of things, and you can use that to feed the, the algorithms that you use to simulate and operate your factories. So we tend to approach it more from a business transformation and a manufacturing transformation point of view. Uh, rather than being driven by a specific technology agenda. And what what is digital? Is that is that just kind of a catch-all for the for the process we're going through and the and the transformation there? Uh, no, I mean I think the best way, the best explanation I got I was talking to one of the big um, beer beer makers, one of the big global breweries, 
And I asked, I asked the senior executive, what's the difference between IT and digital? And he chuckled a bit and he said, well, it's quite simple. IT is about reducing the cost of all the systems that we need to run our business, uh, systems of record and, and infrastructure and email and all that stuff. And, and digital for us is to reimagine the, how digital technologies can change the beer drinking experience, how we can digitize the beverage, digitize the packaging of the beverage, how we can create more value for our, our, our beer drinkers, how we can imagine what a digital pub or a digital bar would look like, how digital technologies can improve the supply chain and, and the production and, and innovation of new beer flavors and, and products. And he went on for quite some time and he said, you know, for us, digital is imagining new possibilities, whereas as, as IT is about basically keeping the systems that we have running and secure and, and, and as, as le least expensive as possible. So for that reason, what we see, particularly here in Europe, is there's an emergence of a chief digital officer and a, and a sort of chief information officer. And the chief digital officer typically puts teams together who are very skilled on innovation tools and methods. So they do design thinking and they run agile sprints and, and have a very different approach to, to problem solving versus a classical IT department. Right, okay. I mean, Joe, we've, I, mean, I don't want to dwell on this particularly, but we've got a lot to get through, but I mean, do, do, I've spoken to you about that. Do you, do, you, do you see it that way or is digital too general a term? Well, the, you know, everything we do is digital. So it just seems, sound or seems <laughs> almost a, a bit redundant to use the term. It's kind of like once upon a time there were phones and then some of them became smarter. So people started saying smartphones. But once they're all smart, you stop calling them smartphones. Now they're just phones. And, uh, and I, I feel a bit that way about, about this, that it's just so pervasive. It permeates, you know, every, everything that we do. Yes, yes. I mean, it seems that, I mean, with that analogy, we're perhaps in this industrial IoT market or this, this digital transformation, we are somewhere, we are, we're at the feature phone level, perhaps. I mean, it only seems from the discussion we've had that, you know, it is important to start small and that there is a tendency among businesses to, to uh, what has been described to me, to follow a kind of a witch hunt for data and then be uh, overwhelmed by it. I mean, Srivats, is that something, I mean, various, uh, speakers have touched upon it. Is that something you think is is important for enterprises just starting out? Is to guard against too much data? Uh, that was a great question, James. Absolutely. So let me elaborate on that. If you think about uh, getting data from machines, a uh, lot of companies collect a lot of data. In my experience, it take us for and you know, we have a ton of data coming out of machines. But the data that we really use out of that is a very, a very fraction of component of that. Historically, we've not been able to take advantage of them because of various reasons like, you know, networks, volume of data, compute, things like that. But now those all become uh, less of an issue. But the real big question is, what do you do with the rest of the data? Do you have an understanding? Do you have a, uh, the ability to uh, process that information in a contextual basis and do things with it? The tools are available, right? But then when you start to think about right. looking at everything, it's an overwhelming experience. So the most successful uh, projects that I have seen, within our company at least, is that we take a sliver of additional data, uh, spend some time understanding the data, and then see whether it makes sense for us to start to build some intelligence and automation around it, and then we continue. The same thing with sensors, right? So as we look at, uh, I get a lot of requests to add sensors, and as we add sensors, the key question is to really understand, why am I adding the sensor? What does this do for me? What's the business value? So it's really important to make sure that everything that you do, you understand how it ties to, how it benefits your business, how it contributes to your p &L. And then once you have that understanding, then reinvest the benefits to the next project to add more sensors and add more automation. So absolutely, so come. It's a, you have to take care in uh, making sure that you don't go overwhelming breadth. You also have to make sure you understand that for that incremental investment I'm making, am I getting the corresponding return? And then you have to methodically approach and scale. That's the approach I would say we should take for these kind of problems. 
and, and Gavin, I mean, just just to turn to you, I mean, certainly that was uh, seemed the the, the 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 essence really of what you did with with Aurelia Metals you know, was to, to get a hold of that data in the first instance and present it in a kind of a meaningful way. I mean, I wonder, you, you know, once the data is in your hands, whether that means putting sensors on it or not, what, what happens next? What are you doing now with Aurelia Metals or what is Aurelia Metals looking to do? What are, you, what are, what are other partners of yours, clients of yours doing? How do they, do they progress from that kind of level three uh, stage kind of, of maturity, which Greg described earlier? Zero balance. Yeah, um, it's a really good question. And yeah, I think there's, it's certainly a, a divide and conquer strategy that we adopt. Um, the sheer volume of data, particularly when you're looking at um, you know, operational systems is, is overwhelming and it just, it's just increasing at an exponential rate. Um, you know, look at one of the, um, you know, a modern you know, operation now um, we do lots of um, LNG processing in, in Western Australia. Um, and one of those organisations has 2 million data points um, being captured uh, in real time. Um, yeah, the, the amount of data is collecting is staggering. And it, the, it's very important to be very focused and driven around you know, what problems are you trying to solve right now. Um, and use that as your as your compass whenever you're looking at, at what you're doing. Um, and I think the, um, yeah, in terms of moving the needle uh, and building on the progress of the past is um, is very challenging. And and technology is quite often only one of the issues. I think people and process and um, and procedure uh, have an important part to play as well um yeah we can optimize and, and improve automation to a point but then it starts to impact how organizations are run and structured so there's an interplay um between the technology and then how the organization behaves and it's the people that operate within it um there's certainly a lot of in, in, uh, impact and disruption around the use of uh, deep learning and machine learning um, and that's, I guess, where there's a lot of attention at the moment. How do we, how do we move the needle? Um, how do we get the next step change in performance? Yes, no, sure. I mean, um, you, you know, looking at um, first steps, just briefly before we move on to, to, to slightly more ambitious projects. But I mean, if you're choosing a platform, you know, JP, I'm presuming that's, that's what you present as the as the start point, the starter kit for this kind of thing. Is that is that is that how you go about it? And just briefly, how have platforms changed in the last six to twelve months? Uh, yeah. So when it comes to uh, to platforms, um, really our our approach and the value it delivers here is in one platform, the different components you need to get started quickly with your IoT projects, analytics, and augmented reality projects. So if we, if we stay on the example from, from PTC for a second, uh, in our platform, we've combined Kepware, we have, which you've mentioned. So that's basically a set of, a library of drivers that talks uh, pretty much all the industrial protocols that can exist in the factory. That's what they've been doing for 20 years. That was a uh, white label solution behind uh, Rockwell automation, uh, behind GE ability to communicate with non-GE and non-Rockwell TLCs and equipment. So it's now part of the platform. It allows you to connect very rapidly to assets on your shop floor. Then we've added to the platform uh, the ability to combine machine data with business data, so standard integration to ERPs and other IT systems. We've acquired and integrated a analytics solution, so you can apply analytics to that data. But it's a flexible platform, so if you decide to choose a different analytics solution, you can do so, but there's one provided with the platform. And with the Rockwell Automation Partnership today, we're bringing the Rockwell Analytics Factory Talk Analytics solution also into the ThingWorks platform. And then once you're connected and you started to build apps, the platform also includes application enablement, so rapidly you can create role-based views or web application to make that data available in a simplified manner to operators. And when it comes to augmented reality, close <laughs> on this from a platform perspective, again, our approach is to make the right integration to keep it easy. 
So when you use Vuforia PTC augmented reality, you don't need to worry about how to connect to the data. It actually consumes data from ThingWorks. So as soon as you're connected, you're connected to the data and you have some predictive analytics insights, then you can transfer them very rapidly in augmented reality since it consumes uh, ThingWorks data. So it, it, it helps actually accelerate the ability for customers to rapidly validate what's the data they're going to get from an IoT project by connecting a lot of these uh, components together in one, one platform. But I, I, as a final comment, I would say uh, IoT is really a team sport. So even though we are proud of adding a complete platform, uh, there's always something else required. So we partner with Rockwell. We partner with Microsoft Azure if you want to host it in the cloud with a lot of the companies that are here, ADLink, et cetera. Uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's really a team sport because the reality of a lot of, of all factories out there is that there's always a lot of different systems and assets from different vendors in place and you need to have all these things communicate with each other. Sure, sure. I've got a question here from, from a, a member of the audience, which, which he once asked of everyone, but I mean, um, perhaps if we can keep it quick, keep it brief, it's essentially about uh, connecting IIoT I, I, devices through, uh, you know, in factory plants, through wired or through wireless, and what is the, um, what is, what is the uh, ultimate solution for this? Is it wired or is it wireless? I mean, it, it's a question which perhaps, which works with around 5G as well, and what role that will play. I wonder if we can each, each of you in turn just quickly go uh, give a give a brief kind of response to this you know the success of of wireless technologies uh, or the likely success of wireless technologies in factories where where they have traditionally relied on on, on wi-fi and ethernet uh, gavin what do you say to that yeah um it's a hybrid um there's some applications <laughs> where wireless is is very much the, the you know the makes sense um technology, particularly when you're looking at um, mobile equipment. Um, the, and sometimes you need, you need wired. Um, I haven't, I don't think there's a single bullet. I think it's very much dependent on the specific operation or manufacturing facility that, um, and the activities that are happening within it. Um, it's, yeah, I don't think there's going to be one or the other. I think there's always going to be a mix. Sure. Okay. And, and Greg, I mean, is, it, is your, do you feel the same about that? Yeah, I agree with the hybrid view. Um, we, we call it a tiered model. So at the edge, you know, the closest tier to the real time, I think most factories still have industrial grade ethernet running a lot of this stuff as they have been for many years. We see 5G coming in though as demands for increased bandwidth um, appear. And I think 5G is a big promise that's, that's been discussed, uh, you know, in the industry 4.0 circles for, for a number of years. Um, but I think it'll, it'll always be a, a kind of a tiered approach where, you know, you've got, you've got your edge running on very specific stuff, and then you've got sort of your next tier, and then ultimately up to your cloud. And then you've got different latency issues and, and broadband issues. And, you know, it's a, it's a technical question of where you need the, the bandwidth and where you need the, the real time, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. I mean, I perhaps won't go around everybody. I suspect that that will be the the default answer. And if anybody wants to chime in there, do they? Uh, the, I'll, I'll chime. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in real quick. So yeah, I'd, I'd agree that that we're going to see these technologies continue to coexist and uh, wired Wi-Fi, cellular, um, uh, SigFox, and uh, Bluetooth. It's it's uh, you'll see all of them on some factory floors. And of course, it absolutely depends on the use case. And there's a few uh, criteria that you need to take into account. So it is bandwidth, which has been mentioned. It's mobility and reliability. So um, and you're not going to use uh, Wi-Fi for, for mission critical applications. Um, and and for for a lot of this industrial equipment, and the easiest thing to do is to use use the uh, industrial Ethernet. And if you need to export data to the cloud, maybe you have a a gateway with a cellular backhaul or something. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's going to continue to coexist. It depends on the use case and, and the business cases. Sure. Yeah. JP, were you going to say something there? Yeah, I, I just uh, fundamentally agree with what was just said. Uh, they will coexist. Um, and uh, the one point I'd like to make is um, 
5 g Wi-Fi are all good considerations for the factory, but very often there's already a network in place and w with IOT and augmented reality, there's a lot we can do with existing connectivity. but of course, if you want to go from visibility to an asset to visibility into a full location and you're in a refinery or a very open space, then yes, a Wi-Fi and 5 g will ultimately be uh, interesting. And uh, I'd say that the adoption is, of 5 g is probably, tied to the adoption of cloud also in the factory. So there are security concerns, but uh, more and more we see manufacturing executives being comfortable with the idea of having a portion of, data, of, their, of their data going through such network. It will never be all of the data. We always need the core operational data uh, at what we call the edge, since it's mission critical and you're running the equipment, but especially when it comes into analytics and augmented reality, then there's a need to add the data dispersed more easily and this is where these type of networks then come into play sure i mean yeah. I, I mean uh you know i mean if we if we you know go forward a little bit and uh look at some of the more advanced stuff i mean ps you've done a piece on you know eight i think i believe it was eight crucial technologies for for, for growth in this space yes if you had to pick one of those the most transformative one could you do that what would it be I, I would say it is the the IIoT platforms and the IIoT in general, just because that that uh, the the networking and the connectivity, uh, the delivering data to where it's needed, serves as kind of a base for a lot of these other technologies and and the the augmented reality. If if you're if you're delivering that to mobile devices or or smart uh, smart glasses, you need the the IIoT connection to deliver live data to that um, so um, yeah I'd, I'd say that's most important just because it serves as a base for all those other technologies sure and Joe I mean just to bring you in here and, and ask you again about I guess computer vision the stuff you're doing there in robotics what kind of impact is that having in, in real terms now on on the factory floor I it's it's really quite tremendous and the you know, it, computer vision, image sensors, it's just a high bandwidth sensor. So, and you have a lot of these kind of applications, the use cases for it, which are very much latency dependent. So I think, you know, computer vision with the local edge compute, with hardware acceleration of models, um, I, with the low latency decisioning, you know, we're seeing things like, you know, in-flight adjustment of welding, uh, we're seeing things like uh, typically with the industrial robotics, you know, whatever they're working on has to be perfectly placed. And the, and you spend a lot of time kind of building a line to make one, a million units of a thing. Um, with computer vision, you have opportunity to have, you know, more ad hoc, different kinds of things getting worked on. You can start to break things down into more flexible cells. And computer vision really is probably the key technology for enabling humans and robots to work together in a more collaborative and a safer manner. And so having the cobots, having the cooperation, um, I think it's just huge. Sure, sure, sure. Just to bring it around to, to use cases, delivering it and, and getting your money back. Greg, I mean, I know you, I mean, you referenced your three to one uh, return, uh, you know, model earlier. There was a question came up in the in the in the in the uh, text questions just now, which I think would be interesting just to just to raise for everyone is is about you know the return on that the rate of the t return the repayment schedule uh, for that. I was wondering if you can elaborate that on that and uh, and really I wonder also if there are use cases where it's you know easy you know low hanging fruit in this what 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 works quick fast and the returns are possibly even higher. <coughs> Good question. And, and what we see, the, the real ROI comes when you have a specific operational problem that you want to address. So if your quality yields have dropped from high 90% down to you know, 70s or 80% for a variety of reasons, and you've struggled to get those yields back, if advanced analytics and, and, and feeding in a, a blended kind of big data um, big database to, to optimize that process will quickly get that yield back to you know, 99%, you're going to print money with that, 
because that drops straight to your bottom line. We, we did a project once, it was quite interesting, it was a quite simple project. Um, we, we digitized the whiteboards in a, an aerospace factory here in Europe, and we did some basic analysis with that data, and we shared that data horizontally along the, the assembly line. And the project cost the client, I'm guessing, probably about 200,000 euros. And the result that the CFO signed off on was about 3 million euros in uh, improved productivity. Because basically what we did was we eliminated the bottlenecks that were plaguing this factory end to end. And so, again, it gets back to what's, what's the problem you want to solve? Oftentimes, we run into clients who have science experiments, and they want to do stuff, and, and they're not even sure what the benefits are. And we typically walk away from those situations. Um, one of the criteria that we look for for our client is, do you have a business case? If, if yes, let's explore it together. If no, um, can we help you do a business case? And then secondly, is, is somebody at the C-level interested in seeing the project be successful? You know, does the C is the CFO depending upon that million that million dollars being added to his bottom line next year? We're 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 running right up. We're fifteen minutes over already. I mean, Gavin, I, I just wonder. I know you've got some 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 quick numbers to share, maybe on on, on ROI and some of these cases. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the general rule of thumb is um is around about yeah from going from a fairly low level of automation and smarts to um you know basic automation is, is about you know, in, in the order of 10 percent improvement to bottom line um and the rois on a lot of the projects that we do in mining and mineral processing um the return on investment is uh, weeks days sometimes um it's a very fast payback for the more complex and difficult, um, higher, I guess, technical risk uh, type projects, that tends to be a bit longer, but you're still talking you know, significant return on investment um, delivered. Uh, and it's been quite, um, quite remarkable, some of the results um, that, it, that have been, been obtained. Uh, and in some cases, it's been... Um, you know, extending the life of mine by two years. You know, that's you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars just purely by using more intelligent machinery, more automated machinery. Um, it's, it makes the difference in, in making the mine viable and profitable or not in some cases. Okay, I mean, I, I've got a couple of questions and, and then we'll, we'll just round off for all those who are hanging on still. But... Um, I mean, the first one's about uh, culture and talent, and it's really two questions. I'm going to put them together and, and just ask, you know, how big an obstacle is, is corporate culture in this? Because when you write these pieces, it tends to be in the conclusion as the ultimate blocker in, in most cases. And secondly, how do you, do you change that through the recruitment process? And how do you bring in the right talent? I wonder, Shrivats, if you could quickly have a... Have a um, respond to those those comments thanks James so uh, I can answer the first one probably elaborate I think the corporate culture is key um, because there's a few things that happens in all of that is you know change management and how the belief in moving to digital the data transformation happens that kind of drives the overall behavior of moving in this direction so I think, I think the corporate culture is kind of what established the foundation for this. And what really happens is that, you know, the plan of the factories by themselves are trying to do something creative. So you start to see some things happen there. And the corporate culture has to facilitate the model of making that visible, adopting the best practice and copying that over and making it pervasive. That's probably what I would say as a, something key for enabling these kind of solutions. Okay, and lastly, just, just really to round up, I and mean, it's been a, a, a fantastic session, but uh, just lastly and quickly, I, I wonder, can each of you, uh, you know, identify, name the biggest single pitfall, if it's not culture, in all of this for IoT projects? Because they do fail, and we do hear about that. What to avoid, and, and how should they avoid it? And I wonder if, if we can go through just in order of, as you are on the screen here. Gavin, what, what would you say to that? Um, it's easy to get caught up in the hype of the latest shiny tech. Um, 
it, and I think it's it's always mindful that it always needs to be brought back to what problem is it solving and how effective is it. And if it doesn't provide a positive return on investment, then there's no point in doing it. So just don't be dazzled by the fancy tech. <laughs> Yes, okay. And uh, Greg, what would you say to that? Greg, Greg you there? We may, may have lost Greg there for, for a moment. Pierce, I wonder what you, your comment might be. And uh, what one big one is IT and OT departments not talking to each other. So, so the IT department starts trying to think about, oh, how can we get everything up on the cloud and, and start uh, analyzing everything without considering how to actually connect equipment or if it will make operations more efficient. And uh, o o or OT, OT um, tries to uh, connect a piece of equipment to, to try and uh, get it to stop failing uh, with, without thinking about how it integrates into the the wider organization. So uh, that that's that's a very common one that's been going on for years and is still a problem is uh, lack of communication between IT and OT professionals. True, that's what what's the what's the biggest pitfall for for uh, uh, manufacturers and factories? Scoping the problem to something small and uh, quick that you can fail fast and improve and be successful. Most companies tend to do a lot more than uh, when they talk about factory and they talk about IoT, they tend to think about all the cool things they can do as well as a broad problem set. And they end up in overwhelming themselves with that. And so picking a really small problem and making sure that you put the right efforts and be successful with it and then take the next step is really key. Mm -hmm. JP, do you agree? It's, it's, a, it's a case of starting small and, 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 you know, this kind of laser focus. Is that the answer to all of this? Uh, absolutely. Uh, think big, but start small and then scale fast as soon as you found a good use case. Uh, there is there is no more appetite in, in the manufacturing community for two years projects where in the first six months you do a blueprint and you hope that two years down the road it will still hold. Uh, manufacturing operations are changing too quickly. So yes, think big, but start small. And especially with these type of technologies, it's when people like maintenance and workers and managers and plant executives see what it means that they really understand the full potential and then they can direct and influence where we should focus next and where should be the second phase. But in order to make that happen, um, starting small and going fast is, is critical. Yep. J and JP Shravats, they're absolutely correct. The, it drives me nuts sometimes. I've seen organizations that literally spend more time, more resource, more, more money debating and looking at a problem instead of just running experiments. So if you have an idea, you have an hypothesis, you know, work with all of us, work with any of us to quickly do an experiment, right? That I think sometimes people don't understand that you can actually, you can actually try something faster than the time you spend debating the feasibility and the merit of it. <laughs> um, Greg, are you back with us? Yeah, I'm back. Apologies for that. Um, I, I agree with what most of the guys have said. I think, I, I think the important thing is to focus on the problem that you want to solve and that you have a process for innovation. Innovation is a process. There are steps you have to go through. And you want to make sure you don't jump to a solution too quickly and really understand the problem. And, and the last thing to add, one thing we get a lot of value out with our clients is when we engage the existing continuous improvement department, the Lean Six Sigma guys, because a lot of these factories have Six Sigma black belts in there. They've been running statistics for quite some time. They've been analyzing processes. And if, if you have an IT-led project that doesn't include those guys, you're missing a whole big chunk of the knowledge that's necessary to solve the problem. Sure, sure, sure. I, I guess the, the message here is that the, the time has gone for these uh, for enterprises to be to be uh, afraid of this if they ever were. It's a it's a time to focus and uh, and and train your focus on what you can uh, you can impact with with the data you have in your hands immediately. Look, that's it from us. Um, I'm afraid we, we've got to stop there. We, are, we have run well over, but as did the presentation. A last reminder again that the report involving 
uh, these and other people, uh, including these from the session, is available online and we encourage you to seek it out. Uh, one last time, I'd like to thank all the panel, Gavin Strack, Executive Director at Convergio, Piers Owen, Principal Analyst for ABI Research, Greg Kinsey, Vice President at Hitachi Bantara, uh, Srivats Ramaswamy from Mason International, Joe Speed, Field CTO for Technology and Solutions at AD-Link, and JP Provencher, Vice President for Strategy and Solutions at PTC. Thank you all very much. It's been a fascinating discussion and we hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you.